for this interview. Definitely. Let's get started. <laughs> Um, Taiwan has been praised for its use of um, technology in fighting the pandemic, and many people have asked this question, what can Europe learn from Taiwan? Um, now, if, if we take, for example, the electronic fence, that seems to be quite a, a, good, mm, a good means to kind of enforce, um, uh, enforce <laughs> home quarantine. Um, but to a German public, it would probably not be acceptable. So, well, then you why? choose hotel quarantine. You don't have to choose home quarantine. I mean, yeah, but, it's, it's your choice. But could you explain why in Taiwan it's not controversial, actually? Well, if you do not like the idea of the digital fence, you can always uh, choose to spend the entire 14 days uh, in a quarantine hotel. It's not uh, mandatory. Uh, but if you choose to spend the second week of the 14 days uh, in your home, uh, then basically because people understand how it works, it's not based on uh, difficult to understand new technologies such as, um, I don't know, Bluetooth or things like that, uh, GPS or things like that. It's based on a very simple idea of SMS and people generally understand SMS. And the uh, idea that we all receive earthquake warnings uh, a few seconds uh, in advance or flood evacuation warnings and so on uh, also informs people that uh, the fence uh, idea is that we can send targeted um, SMS based on your distance uh, to certain telecom towers. So people already had uh, experience uh, something like that before the pandemic. The heuristic was that if we invent new data collection or touch points uh, that didn't exist before the pandemic, then naturally the cybersecurity and privacy boundaries uh, is a mystery and people would uh, kind of have a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt. But because Taiwan never entered a state of emergency, we just reuse components that exist well before the pandemic, the national health insurance card, SMS, uh, QR code and so on, which are, are very easily understood. Mm. If we look at how you trace contacts, um, that uh, that system has been uh, developed in a very short time by civic groups, if I'm yes, um, in full correct. Mm -hmm. If we look at three days, if, if we look at Germany, these, this took months of discussion. And then in the end, once it was ready, it wasn't really accepted uh, by a broad part of society. What is there in, in Taiwan that makes this possible? What is the difference? Well, first of all, the group that invented G0 v arc of zero um, has a uh, track record of what we call forking the government, right? Taking government service that didn't work so well and making better version of it. It's essentially the same community uh, that created the mass creation and visualization uh, early 2020. So exactly one year later uh, or so, May 2021, uh, they worked on the SMS-based contact tracing. So they're well trusted uh, by the civil service. That's the first thing. And the second is that uh, it's not an app. If we ask people to download a new app, we will probably face the same uh, pushback uh, as seen in Germany. Uh, but it's not an app. It's literally your built-in camera in your phone pointing to a QR code. Uh, it pops up the uh, SMS interface sending to 1922, which is a well-known toll-free number. Uh, and people understand these 15 digits is a random code. It doesn't actually give your phone number to the venue owner, to the shop owner. The shop owner knows, knows nothing uh, about uh, your phone number or any contact details. So uh, basically by choosing private privacy enhancing technology, in this case, decentralized storage, we made sure that uh, it's a net win for privacy as compared to, for example, if you write your phone number and in a piece of paper and hand it to the venue, which is always available, like uh, home quarantine versus hotel quarantine. If you don't like the idea of sending an SMS, you can always go back uh, to use paper stamping or writing your way in. Uh, so people who feel that the new way is more secure or more private naturally chose the new way, uh, maybe because it's faster, it's easier to explain. Also, it's friendly to people who don't have uh, the experience of scanning with your phone's camera because if you have a flip phone uh, like I do here, um, here here's a flip phone uh, I can actually uh, you know point this um, 
to to the QR code, but if I don't know how to use it, I can manually text the 15 digits to 1922. So there's no mystery. Again, uh, there's nothing like uh, NFC exchanging, um, you know, uh, unseen signals uh, behind my back, Bluetooth, how does it work, right? It's very transparent. People know exactly what's going on. They just send a 15 digit to the SMS. So the explainability helps on the legitimacy. Now, finally, because it's the human right groups and so on are also part of Gov Zero. So they demanded very early on uh, that it's uh, whenever you scan a QR code, the SMS contains this text, uh, it must be used for epidemic control only. Uh, and so it, you, you can't, uh, for example, get uh, advertisement or whatever other use to it. And only contact tracers uh, can access uh, the actual record. Everyone else just have the shards, the individual pieces that doesn't uh, by itself compromise privacy. So the access and the use is restricted. And people can hold us to account by going into a website, sms.1922.gov.tw, to see the transparency uh, report, to see the statistics of uh, its deletion after 28 days uh, and also entering your own numbers to get a full reverse audit of which contact tracer in which municipality have access your record. I understand the German system does that too. Uh, so maybe on that regard, we have the same uh, concerns. Uh, but the first two, right, the civic tech group that's well trusted and the uh, choice of technology that's easily understood and explained. I think that's what made the difference. Mm. You have success, uh, successfully promoted digital democracy in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. We had we have similar groups actually with similar ideas. I'm sure you've heard about the Pirates mm -hmm. Party, for example, but mm -hmm. they have limited influence in Germany. Mm -hmm. What is there in, in Taiwan democracy? And now I really mean not the technical part, but the society, the, mm -hmm. the kind of forces that shape their understanding of democracy. Mm -hmm. What is there in Taiwan democracy with, that makes it more open to such kind of ideas? I think it's just because it's newer, right? When, when Taiwan got our first presidential election directly in 1996, that's already after the World Web. Right, so it's like if you ask the Estonian people, why why can you get away uh, with electronic uh, public service uh, without taking care of the paper legacy? And they're like, no, we didn't have a paper legacy, right? So so basically, having a newer democracy does help because when we uh, democratized already, or while this there, people's imagination of democracy was already beyond uh, traditional party politics and representative uh, democracy. It's already already um, part of, for example, um, the participatory budgeting um, or part of the uh, local citizens' initiatives, including referendums, uh, many other democratic designs already exist uh, online. And as we democratize, we naturally want to incorporate those what I call higher bandwidth and lower latency uh, democratic methods into our democratization. So I think the fact that we didn't have you know, 200 years or 300 years of a Republican or democratic tradition actually helped here, because then we see democracy as a kind of technology that we just learn how to use, but like semiconductors, you can improve it, right? You, you also in the past spoke about the sunflower movement as a as an important um, factor that shaped uh, Taiwan's democracy. Mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. you explain a little bit what role it played? Certainly. Um, so in 2014, March, uh, the three week uh, nonviolent occupy of the parliament was not just a demonstration against something, it was not just a protest, but it's a demonstration with the people, uh, a demo, uh, showing that half a million people on the street and many more online can actually deliberate reasonably and actually converge to a roughly um, acceptable consensus instead of going nowhere as many other Occupy movement tend to uh, be. Uh, and the, the main difference, I believe, is the use of the, at that time, very new live streaming, documenting technologies, allowing people participating online, uh, the uh, professional facilitation, the orchestration of 20 or so NGOs, each deliberating one aspect of the cross-trade service and trade agreement instead of, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, out of focus conversations, this allowed for focused aspects, for example, around labor condition changes, around uh, freedom of the press changes, around whether we want to uh, have our 4G infrastructure uh, to be uh, captured by the so-called private sector from the PRC uh, and things like that. And that led to actionable uh, consensus. Uh, and then the Occupy was a victory because uh, the head of a parliament agreed upon those uh, consensus items. And the point here is that uh, people can then point at that as like proof of existence, right? Uh, if we can deliberate about this huge uh, scope of CSSTA, certainly the comparatively smaller scope of the Uber or Airbnb uh, should be a piece of cake. Of course, it wasn't really a piece of cake, but it enabled this kind of political uh, conversations. I wonder whether the fact that um Many countries are more, uh, let's say, comfortable with dealing with um, Taiwanese civil society as compared to the government mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. plays a role in kind of strengthening the role of civil society in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that may actually be the case, certainly. Uh, and uh, in Taiwan also, the social sector uh, or civil society, the same thing, the social sector had a lot of legitimacy already, uh, essentially doing GovZero-like things, like providing government-like functions. Uh, but before the internet, the co-ops movement, social entrepreneurship, charity, credit unions, and so on, they're, they're very active uh, in Taiwan. So already we have a strongly trusted social sector even before we had our first presidential election. So in, in that sense, um, like uh, around the turn of the century, when we had a really uh, a large earthquake that was just four years after our first presidential election, people tend to trust the local charities number uh, statistics instead of the government's numbers. So it enjoys a higher legitimacy compared mm. to the mm. administration because the administration only had, you know, four years of popular mandate <laughs> by the democratic uh, uh, theory, right? <laughs> but the social sector had decades of mandate, and that also helps. Um, I was quite impressed uh, at the um, 2020 elections. You have these huge rallies of people, and people really, you know, they go with it. They're like, we, unfortunately, we don't have that in Germany. Mm -hmm. Is that also, and I've seen similar things in Hong Kong, there is really, unfortunately, not anymore, but um, it, it's quite easy to kind of mobilize masses for the idea of democracy is that also does that have to do with the closeness and the and the kind of daily threat uh, from china well, that people uh, cherish uh, more what in, they have. In, in Hong Kong's case, that's that's the case. Certainly, I, I would agree with you. Taiwan is is more complicated because the the threat is not just from the PRC, but rather from our own past. Right, people who are at forty years old or older, that's to say my age or older, we remember the martial law. Uh, I remember my parents being journalists having uh, essentially no press freedom, right? Uh, the one ruling party need to approve uh, the things that they do and they do what they can, of course, but of course it's very limited and there's no freedom to, to form new political parties and that's my childhood. So so people uh, who remember that, of course, continue to struggle to fight for democracy because we know how easily we can slide back to authoritarianism, uh, and we we remember the battle days. It wasn't it wasn't pleasant, uh, and so I think that uh, informs the the current uh, activity and mobilization because people, uh, when we see the tendencies of going back to the authoritarian norms and so on, and it's a non-starter, for example, to to censor speech on the internet uh, because anything uh, that will lead to that, either a uh, you know political proposal from a member of the Parliament or a uh, kind of de facto thing because we work with some, um, you know, uh, so-called private sector uh, 4G suppliers or things like that. People would say, oh, that would enable the white terror. That would enable the dictatorship days again. And then people uh, would uh, vote no and it become a political non-starter. So, of course, PRC is like a daily reminder lately uh, of how that slide that was like. Uh, but even when uh, around the 10th turn of century up to say 2010 or so, when, when PRC looks like it's becoming gradually more open, still our own authoritarian past reminds us that we need to keep struggling for democracy. Mm. Since you mentioned your, your parents, may I ask you, um, 
what kind of experiences shaped your own uh, political conviction convictions? Um, yeah, uh, so th there were both journalists uh, specializing in uh, my mother law, my father politics, uh, respectively, in their graduate studies. Uh, and of course, our dinner table is, you know, uh, talking about uh, people kind of illegally forming a new political party and whether uh, democratic progress, what does progress mean, and things like that. So, so it's a very political dinner table. And uh, uh, also, part of the, my early experience involves participating in uh, the environmental groups. Uh, my mom was one of the initiators of the Homemakers Union, uh, initially a uh, foundation uh, advocacy group, but uh, very quickly became a consumer co-op that fights for uh, environmental justice. And uh, uh, I, I remember, you know, going to uh, trips uh, to see the negative environmental externality caused by pollution, learning about uh, this whole um, Nowadays, of course, we would call it a circular economy. That at the time there's no such term, right? So uh, the the basic idea that uh, we're we're overtaxing the earth and uh, uh, we need to change our economy to be regenerative. Otherwise, uh, when I was eight, I understood that it would be uh, I'm at a kind of business end of environmental pollution uh, and so on. That the younger people will suffer more and so on. So um, before I um, kind of migrated to the internet when I was 12 years old, uh, I already already spent uh, four or five years uh, of time in the more kind of traditional analog, um, including rallies and field trips and um, co-ops uh, and unions and so on uh, movements. So that also informs my own political understanding. And you also spent a year in Germany, of course, as a German media, we are interested in mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Is it true that you met Chinese dissidents with the experience uh, of the mm. Tiananmen yeah, movement? That, 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 that was my, my father's uh, thesis, right? Uh, his thesis, PhD thesis uh, in the Zachbrücken uh, University uh, was uh, the dynamic of uh, communication uh, between the student factions in the Tiananmen uh, Square, because he was uh, at the Tiananmen Square uh, until June the 1st, uh, which is very fortunate, I guess. Uh, and so um, he, he made friends uh, with many exiles uh, who fled uh, to Germany, to France, um, Luxembourg, uh, many uh, nearby European places. And because uh, to complete his uh, thesis, uh, he need to um, figure out what actually happened right, uh, during the, the Tiananmen. And so uh, I remember occasionally uh, his um, interview subjects will be invited to, um, to watch TV together and have dinner <laughs> with, with us. And, and they were uh, Tiananmen exiles, suddenly. Not so long after you've been to a German school, you dropped out of school. <laughs> Is there any connection? No. Or, or no. how was that experience uh, uh, for you to be in a German uh, school? Well, I, I, I was uh, in the... Um, uh, a, a, a primary school uh, when I was 11, right? So uh, my classmates were 10 uh, because I, I don't know any Germany uh, like friends at the time and I don't speak German at all. So uh, it, it's unlikely that I'll just go to Germany and enter a gymnasium. It doesn't work that way. So uh, I, I spent a, a year with people, one year my, my junior. And that contrasts a lot with my experience in Taiwan the year before, because when I was 10, I was spending time with people two years my senior, because I was jumping grades and uh, spending time in the sixth uh, grade uh, in the primary school. So uh, theoretically, that means that uh, uh, the, the people I meet in Taiwan should be at least one year or two more mature than the people I meet in Germany, my classmates. Uh, but it's not that like that. My German classmates were at least five or six years more mature, uh, it seems to me, uh, than my uh, Taiwanese classmates. They were basically treated like uh, young adults uh, who have to take care of their own schedule, especially after 3 p.m., of course, uh, in their uh, activities and so on, whereas in Taiwan, everybody go to, uh, if not cram uh, school, at least uh, very uh, long studying hours on standardized answers and certainly not playing uh, soccer, right? So uh, basically, it's a, it's a very different uh, outlook on how primary school uh, age students should interact with their parents and adults and so on. And uh, I feel there's a lot of autonomy uh, and uh, freedom to associate, to interact with adults, just like adults uh, in, in Germany. My mom uh, wrote a book. 
uh, describing the German education system uh, to the Taiwanese uh, audience. So that also informed our uh, education reform a few years uh, down the line because we, we generally understood if we treat uh, you know teenagers as uh, babies, then they don't mature. <laughs> it's the <like> Pygmalion <laughs> effect. But if we treat teenagers as adults, like the people in Germany uh, do, uh, then they, they mature very quickly. You are actually a good example of how uh, civil society and government cooperate in, mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been asked this before, but I found your answer so mm -hmm. interesting that I'm asking you again. Mm -hmm. You are calling yourself anarchist, right? And at the same time, oh, conservative mm -hmm. anarchist. Uh -huh. You have to explain that as well, what it means. But at the same time, you are now a minister. You're part of mm -hmm. the cabinet. How does that go together? Uh, I don't work for the government. I work with uh, the government. Uh, I don't work for the people either. I work with the people. So the, the part of anarchism uh, is, um, or to a more American audience, I would say left libertarianism, uh, but I prefer anarchism. <laughs> anarchism uh, means that uh, I, don't, I don't do coercion, right? I, I don't force, give order uh, my colleagues to do anything. Everybody in my office is joined by voluntary association, and I don't receive orders or coercions. Uh, from the president or premiers either, right? So, so the the idea here is that uh, I, I'm not here to kind of uh, disrupt um, traditional uh, institutions. Um, so that's the mostly conservative part. Uh, but I'm uh, making it very easy uh, to start new kind of social uh, institutions uh, that like of zero fork. The traditional institutions, meaning take the best part of it the, as materials, uh, but then go ahead and do a different contact tracing, vaccination, uh, working, or uh, mask uh, rationing uh, system beyond uh, what the traditional institutions has to offer. So I'm conservative in what I do, but I'm very liberal in what I enable other people to do uh, in, in, in a sense. Uh, and again, uh, purely in a way that's non-coercive. And, and the, um, the other members of the cabinet, uh, do they feel comfortable with the idea that you are not working for the government? Sure, of course, sure. Uh, because I, I'm after all not bomb throwing, right? I'm not that kind of anarchist. So uh, they, they, they like the fact that um, by working digitally uh, and working with, not just for the people, uh, the risk is lower because uh, people don't just point out problems. Once we share the underlying data, API, uh, and information with the people, people who point out problems often just bring us solutions too. Uh, and so it, it flips uh, the, the relationship around. I call it reverse procurement. We become like IT vendors <laughs> because the people already figure out the solution and we just have to cover the SMS fee or something. right? So uh, the, the point here is that it turns a uh, relationship of distrust into a relationship of mutual trust and that lowers the risk for everyone involved. And also it saves them time. right? Instead of having to explain the problem, uh, we just uh, ask people who complain the most to co-create a solution and after you don't have to explain the problem anymore. Do you, do you think there are limits to direct democracy? For example, when it comes to military budget, you wouldn't mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. maybe the mm -hmm. population to directly decide on the military budget. But that was that's because of the state secret that uh, prevents people from being fully informed. And of course, if you are not fully informed, you can't do participatory budgeting. So, uh, of course, yes, uh, there are limits uh, to uh, direct democracy. Uh, the MPs, if you if they don't uh, have uh, visibility into the defense plan, I'm sure they can't talk about defense budget either, right? So, uh, it, it, the, the limit is uh, on the freedom uh, of information involved. Involved. And uh, no matter whether it's for privacy reasons, for uh, trade secret reasons, uh, for you know defense reasons, as you pointed out, if you do not have the uh, radically transparent uh, data and information pipeline, of course, it's impossible to do uh, direct democracy around that topic. Mm. I would like to talk a little bit about the dangers uh, to Taiwanese Taiwan's democracy. Mm -hmm mainly from the side of the of, of China. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, for example, uh, China has threatened Taiwanese companies uh, not to donate uh, money to the DPP, for example. Mm -hmm. it, how, mm -hmm. how much of a danger is that to the democracy? Mm -hmm. 
So far, uh, I think the, the general consensus from the press uh, here, uh, the journalistic community, is that, uh, of course, it's quite symbolic, uh, but currently it has um, negligible effect uh, on our uh, democratic institutions. And, uh, um, of course, uh, we, we do understand that m many a time it's not about the DPP or, or it's not about any particular political party. It's about uh, trying to paint democracy as a kind of fundamentally less effective uh, way of doing things. Uh, and the uh, authoritarian model is the only way to, I don't know, win against the pandemic or win against the infodemic and things like that. It is a kind of model to model uh, comparison uh, effect that they want to uh, effect. Uh, and so uh, I think in the past few years, we've seen um, Taiwan proving that uh, more democracy is actually the answer to pandemic, right? More democracy uh, is the answer to the infodemic because, uh, for example, the, the same Omicron uh, variant, uh, the freedom of the press, the freedom of assembly and speech made sure that we get to uh, know how how's it going on uh, very quickly because people generally trust uh, each other uh, with information. They don't uh, not just uh, obey the rules, so to speak, but understand the uh, epidemiology uh, principles uh, that would enable, for example, sufficient contact tracing to be made very early uh, in the domestic transmission. Uh, but in a place, uh, in a jurisdiction that has uh, little to none journalistic freedom or the incentive to do freedom of speech uh, exercises because it could get harmonized, uh, then the authorities, even with the best intention, learn about these things rather late in the game. Uh, that, that's why Dr. Li Wenlong saved the Taiwanese people, but not the people in Wuhan. That was the, mm -hmm. the reason. So uh, I think uh, if people in Taiwan were kind of in doubt of the democratic model uh, in response to emergency, the past couple years kind of proved uh, that no matter what symbolic actions other people from the more authoritarian regime take, uh, the democratic model actually works pretty well. Mm. I know that uh, Taiwan has a fascinating system of uh, dealing with disinformation. Mm -hmm. How how dangerous are these disinformation campaigns of uh, from China? Actually, if you, if I look at the English version, uh, much of it is actually not very convincing, and so far uh, its impact hasn't reached the English speaking world. Uh, how mm -hmm. is that in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, for example, there was one uh, piece of viral disinformation uh, in 2019, um, November or December, uh, about, and I quote, uh, the young people in Hong Kong are being paid 20 million to murder police, uh, end of quote, uh, and a scary looking photo um, that says, you know, this young person uh, uh, received this uh, bounty and bought some iPhones and recruited younger brothers to riot and kill police or whatever. So uh, basically that there was a kind of viral uh, thing going on in Taiwan uh, and not in Hong Kong because they probably uh, see it for, for its untruth very quickly. Uh, and and the, the photo was real. It was a Reuters photo. But the original Reuters uh, caption was just there are young people in Hong Kong protesting. Right? It says nothing about being paid to kill police. Uh, and so the alternate caption uh, has to come somewhere. right? Uh, and because we do have a pretty good uh, advanced warning system that kind of let us see which uh, disinformation are trending, uh, are going viral, having a higher R value. Uh, so our uh, fact checkers, independent, not state owned, uh, tend to focus on the things that are actually just about to go viral. And in this particular case, they trace this caption to uh, the Zhongyang Zhenfa Weichang Anjian, the Central Political and Law Unit's Weibo account of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, now they're quite overt about it. It's not covert. Uh, and then the uh, people took that caption from their Weibo and then remixed uh, even more scary looking uh, messages uh, trying to increase its R value, I'm sure. Uh, so, But uh, we didn't take anything down. Rather, uh, we just uh, put a public notice. So when you share it on social media and so on, it says, according to the Taiwan Fact Check Center, this is 
sponsored by the CCP essentially <laughs> in their Weibo. Uh, and, and so then it turns a, a viral um, vector into a viral vaccine of sorts, right? <laughs> People would understand the message is there, but they would not blindly uh, uh, share it. Uh, they would share it within a different frame. Uh, and that's actually how mRNA vaccines work. Uh, they become immune uh, to a few further uh, information manipulation. So that's just one anecdote that shows uh, how um, Rob Roughly, uh, our counter disinformation tactics work. Mm, mm. You speak a lot about trust, um, and at the same time, when we talk in Europe about the challenge of authoritarianism, there is a tendency to actually uh, become less open. Right? It's it, there is mm, there are issues of, as you said before, um, mm -hmm. national security or the concept of national security becomes broader. There are now issues of. Uh, for example, cooperation on uh, on the university side, and even as you can see in America, uh, American professors are becoming the focus of, of these kind of fears. So how does this go together to be an mm -hmm. open society and at the same time, yeah. you know, being yeah. faced with these kind of, because mm -hmm. authoritarianism tends to mm -hmm. uh, misuse that openness, right? Yeah, this is a really great question. This is like asking, uh, why are we not imposing travel restrictions uh, domestically in Taiwan, uh, even when we had uh, previous uh, spikes of alpha and then later smaller scale delta and Omicron uh, infections? Uh, certainly, uh, when it's like really bad, uh, then of course some restrictions of movement would probably be justified and probably we will have to declare a state of emergency and, and so on. But uh, Taiwan never did that, right, in the past couple of years, not a single day. Uh, and the reason is that at the early stage, uh, we believe it's much more important that people understand how exactly does mask work, how hand washing works, how social distancing works, uh, how good ventilation helps and things like that. So when, when the uh, knowledge is open uh, and when every day at 2 p.m. Uh, the CCC, the Central Epidemic Command Center answers all the journalistic questions, the entire journalism community become kind of co-creators of an, uh, counter pandemic policies uh, by reporting emerging issues, but also correcting the issues that the CCC wasn't doing properly. Properly and so on. And so uh, before it got really bad, uh, we controlled our value to be well below one. So it doesn't actually uh, come to a point where we have to declare a lockdown. Uh, and speaking both factually and metaphorically. So on information manipulation from authoritarian regimes, uh, if it goes really, really bad, then of course, uh, some sort of uh, more, you know, takedown oriented approach, uh, shadow ban or whatever, will probably enter the political discourse. Uh, uh, but uh, before that, if we can get people's idea of public mental health in the information space, that's a long way. Let's just talk, talk about journalism. If people learn about journalism uh, and to learn about fact checking, about the framing effect, uh, and so what, they become immune to the discord that the authoritarians uh, may exploit. So uh, by increasing the people's uh, internal defense, the antibodies of the mind, so to speak, uh, by participating in media competence programs and fact checking and so on as early as primary school and as uh, long as uh, the elderly in the lifelong education, uh, people become much more immune to information manipulation. And then, uh, because it never got really bad, so we don't have to uh, go to drastic measures, we can then stay open. So mm -hmm. um, I think we're but quite Taiwan fortunate that uh, it worked like this, uh, because if it doesn't work, we probably will be forced to declare some sort of state of emergency. Yeah, but Taiwan does have some strict uh, rules, for example, for former uh, members of the administration when they want to go to China. So there are limits to openness, right? Certainly, because uh, what I'm trying to, to talk about uh, here is domestically 
right? Uh, revealing the uh, advertisement on social media during election seasons so that investigative journalists can draw their conclusions and uh, look at, for example, foreign-sponsored advertisement and ban them, right? So it's not like we don't ban them. Uh, well, once there's evidence uh, that they're not as accountable as our domestic norm, of course we ban them. Uh, and this is very much like border quarantine. <laughs> so uh, so I, I'm talking about radical openness and democracy within the border. Uh, but of course, that need to be coupled with a pretty good border quarantine. Mm -hmm. You have said that um, uh, uh, open democracy, Taiwan's open democracy has become an export product. Yes. Can you give an example of, mm -hmm. of, of, of a country where actually they have mm -hmm. taken some something from you or, or many, where many, many things uh, and usually it's on the people to people uh, way not government to government uh, and you already uh, pointed out why so I will not elaborate so uh, for example the, the mass rationing map uh, last February after Taiwan implemented that uh, I think uh, Seoul South Korea uh, did exactly the same thing uh, one month afterward essentially by their civic tech people I've met some of them there there is like like as young as 12, I believe, uh, who, who talk to the uh, Korean uh, government uh, in municipality and say, you know, if Taiwan can do that and the code is already there, why don't we just uh, join this way of uh, visualizing the rationing system? Uh, so that's one. The co collaborative fact checking, COVAX, uh, has been adopted by people in Thailand, uh, of course, because of their uh, civic space. Uh, they mostly, I believe, uh, focus on uh, kind of safe. Uh, uh, food safety and drug safety and, and issues that are not as political as the Hong Kong example I just pointed out, but it's still very uh, useful and I'm sure that also helps their social sector gains uh, legitimacy. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, the, the way that we conduct uh, the digital transformation uh, by uh, promoting design uh, alongside uh, data and deliberation and so on in the cabinet office in a cross-ministerial interagency way. Uh, I believe uh, Japan uh, ratified that in, in law uh, last year uh, and established their uh, digital agency uh, within the cabinet office and so on. Uh, and because I'm kind of monthly uh, was having a conversation with the professor uh, related to, to that effort, I'm pretty sure that they actually look at our uh, design for digital transformation within the government incorporated uh, many ideas there. Uh, and I, I can actually go on, but that was just some of the more recent <laughs> Uh, memories. Yeah. Um, China's, uh, um, sorry, Taiwan's uh, contribution to, mm -hmm. to democracy has also been acknowledged by um, being invited to that uh, mm -hmm. summit, for democracy. Summit, summit for democracy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, at the same time, uh, the, um, the summit um, also showed kind of the limits of Taiwan's engagement. If, mm -hmm. if I may give it this example, that mm -hmm. when you gave your presentation, kind of it was turned from video to audio. It, were uh, you disappointed about this? Well, uh, the thing is that uh, contrary to, to many media reports, if you go back uh, to that uh, live stream, uh, it, really the, the map uh, was shown in its entirety uh, and my opening speech uh, was uninterrupted. It's 20 minutes after the map showed on the closing speech uh, for two and a half minutes uh, did it become uh, audio only. And, and I believe uh, the, the reason why, because I have had a conversation with the technical people at the time, uh, was that uh, they, they thought that I would be uh, using Zoom's uh, share screen feature, I believe. Uh, but I, I, that wasn't what I was doing. I was <clears throat> essentially uh, merging my slides uh, into my camera feed. So there was a kind of misunderstanding uh, at the control center, I believe, uh, for the Zoom um, control. And then, uh, of course, then it, it didn't quite work. And so they just uh, showed the audio. So uh, and uh, the slide that I was uh, about to show uh, that didn't get shown was this. Uh, it's a um, let me just very quickly uh, show it to you. So um, it's here, right? So I was like this and then like this. So as you can see, it's not a screen share. It's uh, just 
my camera suddenly uh, changes content. So maybe they were not expecting that, right? Uh, and but uh, if you look at the actual content that I show, it's uh, just air pollution uh, map, it's, right? It's, it's, yeah. Right. It's okay. it's it's PM two point five, and I don't think there's anything uh, geopolitical about this particular map. The underlying <laughs> map is is Google Maps, uh, and so uh, I, I believe it, it's a technical glitch. Uh, I, I wasn't. Uh, uh, holding it to to be associated with the the previous map that uh, Reuters reported, and I uh, of course have a local recording that I uploaded to YouTube right afterwards. And right after the panel, uh, I told the technician that I have a local copy, so it would be great if they just upload the full thing to their summit uh, schedule page. Uh, and then I go to sleep, and when I wake up, it's on the schedule page, uh, well before the Reuters report. So uh, to me, that's already settled then, and. Uh, I, but I must thank the Reuters report because I benefit from the so-called Strayson effect, right? So uh, initially, there's not so many people listening to my talk, but uh, after the Reuters report and its wide circulation, uh, uh, including Twitter and many social media, my speeches have been listened to, I think, uh, immediately more than 200,000 times, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then much more afterwards. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm happy for the free exposure, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite a bit, if, if I may ask this last question, mm -hmm. I mean, this whole issue of maps mm -hmm. is becoming more and more of an issue. How do you feel about this? This must be quite mm -hmm. a nuisance. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's actually look at the map, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and, and I think that the thing with, with this map uh, was that it's it's really about the degree uh, of democracy, uh, degree of the civic space and so on. Uh, the, and, and people will look uh, at it very differently, of course, coming from different political backgrounds. Uh, for example, people from Hong Kong uh, will note that Hong Kong is not painted red. Uh, and so uh, Hong Kong is painted uh, black, actually. <laughs> so so there's no sufficient information about Hong Kong that we can determine its civic space is in a unknown stage. <laughs> it's an unknown state according to the uh, Civicus Monitor. Uh, and people who care about various different jurisdictional boundaries, of course, will we, we'll look uh, into this. But uh, I chose this map precisely because it's it's really not about sovereignty, uh, and it, it's really just about the degree of civic freedom and and this um also works in the same uh, i guess idea as my chosen background right it's uh, basically a real reflection of the the light uh, in the night uh, as seen by a uh, space shuttle or a telescope or something uh, from outer space uh, and and i like maps like this uh, that <laughs> are, are, are are less uh, charged uh, with geopolitical boundaries Thank you very much, Minister mm -hmm. Tan. Yeah, thank you. A really good question. Very nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, just to uh, to make make sure uh, you will be publishing just a text, right, not a video of this conversation. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That's right. Uh, that's and right. and would but you? But I I guess you are publishing a video, which made me very okay? nervous. Would you be okay <laughs> if I publish not your face, not your video feed? Just, just my. Oh, I see. And you should have told and, me in the beginning. And, and, I would have been less. I would have been less nervous then. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Apologies. <laughs> because it's a new experience. It's a new experience uh -huh. for me. Apologies. But it's, it's totally fine. Whatever, yeah. whatever you do, that's your. No, no, no. But but it would just have your, your voice choice. and then my video, uh, and so you don't have to be that nervous. Uh, but do we need to embargo it, like after you publish, or is it fine if I just publish it now? It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. Bye-bye. <laughs>